Welcome back to the Behind Their Business podcast, or if this is your first time listening to the show, welcome. Today, our guest is going to share her story about franchising her boutique dance studio business. So she's going to share different learnings, up and downs from this experience. And I personally worked at a digital marketing and PR agency for many, many years, and we specifically worked with the franchise industry. So I'm always excited to hear different people's perspective on an industry that I don't feel like is talked about enough. So um, we're going to dive into that a lot, and I'm really excited for her to share her story. But in her business, our guest is the founder and CEO of Bella Bella Ballerina, which now has corporate and franchise locations. She also has a private label dancewear brand and does online coaching and consulting to help other dance studios uplevel their own businesses, which I love. So she's taking everything that she's learned and sharing it with others. So please welcome to the show, Natalie Perkins. Natalie, I'm so glad you're here. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. (laughs) You're so welcome. And if you're not watching the video, you can see that she has the most beautiful hair. It's like pink and purple and gorgeous. And we were just talking about how jealous I was <laughs> that I would love to have felt like here right now. So um, let's just, let's dive right in. So let's talk about your first studio. Where did this idea come from in the first place? Yeah. So I was actually trying to start an entirely different business. This was like not even on my radar and, um, and nobody has done that existing business. So like, I want somebody to do it so badly still after all this time, but the startup capital for that business was like $500,000. And at the moment, nobody was giving me $500,000. I was super young, didn't qualify for any financing or whatever. So I just sort of put it on the back burner and just kind of went along with my life. And at the time, um, my daughter had just been born and then fast forward like two and a half years, she was ready for a dance. So I put her in dance class at a, at a local dance studio and, you know, it was fun. Nobody will ever say that they didn't have fun in that class, but it wasn't what I was looking for. It was basically a play group kind of disguised as a dance class. And I wanted something she would actually like learn from. And so I started looking at other locations and it was basically the other end of the spectrum. It was all like, come in a black leotard and pink tights, Tuesday, 10 o'clock hair in a bun. And I'm like, I don't know if you've met my three-year-old, that's not going to happen. So I was like, why is there not anything in the middle? Like what I grew up with in a small town was right in the middle. It was like a studio you went to once a week. It was super fun. You looked forward to it, but you learned something too. And so I was like, how come nothing like that exists? And then sort of had this aha moment that, wait a second, a dance studio is what I should be doing And it would be much less startup capital to open, which would solve my financial problem of starting my own business. But also it was an industry that I had grown up in and I had been really like intimately familiar with from dancing and teaching myself. And so we decided to open a studio. And of course, everything today is so like niche focused. And my favorite niche for dance is the littles, you know, it's uh, like up to eight years old because at that point they sort of then decide what they want to do seriously, which just seems so funny to ask an eight-year-old what they want to do seriously, but they just start to devote more time to it. So we focus on kids 18 months to eight years old and it's our little niche and we love it. And we have classes that are all storybook themed. So it's a very unique way of teaching dance because of course, toddlers don't necessarily respond to like, you know, proper ballet terminology. But if you, you know, have just read the story about Sophia the first and you tell them to show off their Sophia amulet, they sort of all of a sudden like stand up in proper posture. So it helps use the visualization from the story and 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 bring it into the classroom. And it's a really fun way for kids to experience dance and learn that foundational piece of it um, as they are really young. Okay. Yeah. I I love everything about this. And I have so many follow-up questions, but my first question is you mentioned that you have a dance background. So did you, you grew up going to dance, like similar, at a similar age that your daughter is. And yeah, then how long yeah. did you do that for? Yeah. So I danced from the time I was like three to the time I was through college. Um, but just recreationally, nothing like I'm not a professional dancer by any stretch. I don't claim to be a professional dancer, um, but that's not what we're doing here. You know, we're not, we're, we're working with kids under eight. The, the curriculum is very narrow. So we're trying to teach them good foundational um, pieces and technique and really just develop a love of dance, which is more important sometimes than having perfect technique. So all of our teachers, for us, the most important aspect in a teacher is that they 
have a passion for and are great at working with little kids and have, you know, this dance background sort of secondary um, to it because we have great training for them and all of that. But yeah, I mean, what I grew up in is basically what we've recreated, but sort of like with a little bit of a, you know, more modern um, marketing friendly twist on it. (laughs) Yeah, this is so interesting. So it's similar to, so my son, he just turned three and we've been doing swimming lessons for him for the past year. And it's kind of the same thing. Like you're not going to expect a three-year-old to like go and swim laps at a pool. Yes. Right. But you do want to teach them like water safety. You want to get them comfortable in the water. So I'm assuming it's very similar to that, like getting comfortable with the steps, all of that. Absolutely. And a lot of times, you know, with, with, I mean, we start 18 months, so it definitely is their first experience in an organized activity. Even some of our like two and three year olds, this is their first experience in an organized activity. And um, we do have a very open concept because we're very aware that, you know, kids are most comfortable trying something for the first time when like mom is right there (laughs) and it just feels very safe. Also parents right now, especially in this you know, time, safety is a big concern. So they're never going to watch our classes through like a little window or a closed circuit TV. They're watching it. It's happening right in front of them. Um, but yeah, so it's a little bit different. We do because they are all mostly toddlers. We also are unique in the sense that we only have them take class for like 12 weeks at a time. They can commit to longer, but they don't have to sign up for this like whole year long activity. You know, it's like, that's not really how life works with a toddler. So um, we try and make it convenient for parents and something that fits into their life. Oh, that's so smart. So you approach the business model from the perspective of a parent, yes. see, which, uh, duh. <laughs> like, well, and it, it makes it, it easier so... for them to say, yes, I want to do this. It makes right. seems to make much more sense than oh, I'm not sure I have to weigh the options. I have to think about this or that. It's like, if it, if it makes sense from the, from the customer's perspective, it makes it easier for them to say yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I have a follow-up question, but I'm I'm going to wait for a second because I would love to s- dive into why you decided to franchise that. So you obviously started with one location and you said that franchising was a no-brainer decision for you. So what made it yeah. a no-brainer decision? So we opened in 2011 with one location and, um, and quickly after opened a second one, we opened a second one within inside of a year. And then opened a third one a year after that. Oh my gosh. And then I was like, yeah. And I was like, okay, let's hit the pause button for a second and decide what we want to do with this, which direction we want to take it. Because at that point we could say, this isn't a fluke. You know, this is, this is something that's really working. And we would open each location with like anywhere between 75 and hundred kids already enrolled. So it wasn't, it definitely wasn't a fluke. It was definitely something that could grow. And we had ch- tested it in different markets. So at that point, it was, do we continue down this road and open like 30 studios by ourselves, right? And just build out a region and just have this mini dance empire? Or do we start franchising this um, and kind of taking it to the masses, right? And at that point, I knew for myself, it was 1000% about franchising because even though it was it, a, a second sort of scary leap after starting a business, it was like starting another business. But um, at that point, I was like, this, this isn't a fluke. And we've been really successful with this. I can't not give this opportunity to other women, like, because the dance industry is not traditionally a profitable one. And I knew that there would be other people out there, other women out there, other moms out there who were either exactly in my same position and like wanting more freedom and flexibility within their work life that wanted to own, and own you know, own their own business and just needed the right path. And so I was like, we need to do this like that because at the heart of it now where we have these studios open, my passion is really working with the studio owners and helping them grow their companies and see all of the benefits from it. And of course, helping other studio owners. So for me, that's a, that's a very foundational piece of why I keep doing this and what makes me fulfilled. Um, So even looking back then, that was for me, that was like a no brainer. I was like, yes, this is the direction we're going. Yeah, that's so amazing. So when you started that initial studio, I know you said that you had another business idea too. So do you have a business background of any kind or was just, do you just have ideas and you're like, yeah, I I was, I went to school for business, went to college for business. I didn't really know like what I wanted to do. I pretty much knew from a very young age, I was going to work for myself. My dad always worked for himself. I saw both sides of that, but I was like, I'm doing that. I'm never going to work for somebody else. (laughs) And I did work for other people throughout, you know, like over time as I started, but 
ultimately I knew that was like the path I was going to take. And I probably had 15 million business ideas before we really landed on this one. And I'd run them by my husband. Oh, how about this? And in my mind, it was like already a company. And I was like, had a logo and colors and a website. And sometimes I went so far as to actually create those things before talking to him. But, um, you know, he'd always ask me really insightful questions about, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? And I was like, oh, no. (laughs) But then once we landed on this, it was like, we had a lot of conversations about it. And it was ultimately like the thing that made the most sense at the right time in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So that makes complete, I'm the same way. Like I'll get like at least five new business ideas a day. And I'm not in the stage where I'll go out and create the logo and website because I definitely did do that before. Mm -hmm. And spent many, many days doing things like that. But I can totally relate to that. And I think many entrepreneurs can as well. Um, Now, when you decided to move into franchising, did you have any experience in that world? No. No. And and to be honest, I still feel like I don't have any experience at it. Like, even though we've been doing it for a while and we brought on lots of new franchisees and we've been through the process and we have a really strong infrastructure for franchisees. Like I, I'm really proud of that. Like probably more than you would ever find in a lot of other companies. I still feel really inexperienced because it's, it's just like starting a business. You don't know what you don't know. And that's a whole other world. And I didn't, I didn't have any mentors in it at the time. Like I didn't know anybody who was a franchisor. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know what I was doing. And so I made a ton of mistakes, which ironically is one of the reasons you buy a franchise. So you cannot make the same mistakes and you kind of are buying away your mistakes, you know? So it's, it's, that's kind of funny actually, but the, but yeah, I I really, you don't know what you don't know. And in franchising, it's expensive. That's the one thing I did not know is how expensive the process is to own and operate a franchise company. Um, and I wish somebody would have told me that, but, but in the same, like it's, you know, it's worked out well for us. It's just kind of feels like a bumpy road, probably even bumpier than starting the actual studio. Yeah. I mean, there's so much that goes into that. People don't think about like the contracts alone take a ridiculous amount of time to come. Yes. With, and you have to have individual franchisee contracts and then like the overarching franchise or contracts. Like I'm testing my knowledge from a few years ago. I'm pretty yes. sure that works. But yeah, yeah, so we have a franchise disclosure document and it takes months and months and months to create your first one. And then you have to file it every single year in all the states that you do business with. The original document, just to create the original document, is somewhere like between $25,000 and $50,000. Yep. I mean, so just to get off the ground, to move your business from being like a couple locations to offering franchises. And that ha- that says nothing about all the other legal stuff you have to worry about or like I said, developing infrastructure for now, when you bring in a franchisee, how do they know what to do? How do you onboard them? How do you market this franchise? Like there are so many moving pieces and even being in business for so long, it's like, I don't know what I'm doing. (laughs) When did you open your first franchise location? So we opened our first franchise location in 2016. And then I really wanted to grow pretty, I know it sounds silly to say I want to grow slow, but I didn't want to let anybody down. I wanted every franchisee to have a really amazing experience, have a ton of support. So we grew a couple locations over the next year before next couple of years, before we even really started marketing at all, um, to make sure really, truly everything was in place. And then after that, then a lot of franchise owners, they start working with brokers and brokers are in essence trying to bring you qualified people who are already interested in opening a franchise and your type of franchise is maybe something you would be interested in. I found that very unappealing (laughs) because I felt like brokers were just bringing people who were like interested in business, but really had no interest in my business. And so from then on, I was just like, nope, we're not playing that game. Uh, we're going to grow organically and we're going to market, but we're going to grow organically finding people who are interested in us. And oddly enough, a majority of our franchise owners are people who have been previous dance families at our studios and then have either like moved or opened in a, you know, in a close market somewhere to where we already exist. So we are growing pretty organically and sort of like a regional way. We had a family of ours in Virginia who moved down to Florida. They opened a studio and now we're opening more studios in Florida because they just see it and they get the concept immediately and are kind of fall in love with it, you know, cause they're a mom usually with a daughter who's in our studio and they're like, hi, how can I not want one of these for myself? 
Yeah, no, that's so great. So do you have any franchisees who have multiple locations at this point? We do. Yeah, we have. Um, when you sign a franchise agreement, you have the option to do what's called an area development deal so that you can open one and then on a certain timeline, open others, usually in neighboring locations. So you sort of are securing those territories. And it's really like, it's fascinating because when you're in the, our industry anyway, and, and this particular business, opening multiple locations doesn't mean doubling your workload if they're like in neighboring communities. So it makes it very easy to, you know, after the first year be like, oh, I totally know what I'm doing now. This is a cyclical business. The same stuff happens every year. A second location is, is would be so easy. And so even if they didn't intend on doing that at first, we have owners who have signed uh, multiple locations. So well, yeah, and you already, you have all the, you have the process for them. They literally just have to rinse and repeat it in a yes. physical location, which is amazing. So yeah. can uh, this may be a difficult question for you to answer, but can you share maybe like, let's say your top two or three learnings from either opening the initial studio or franchising the business as a whole? Yeah. So for both of those top thing is get a mentor, get a mentor who has walked the road before you. It, nothing says that you have to do it exactly the same as them, but you need somebody who has, you know, has been through it before, has been through the good, bad, and the ugly to be able to just bounce ideas off of, ask them questions, run things past them. Um, investing in professionals who like having a franchise specific attorney is like such a wildly helpful thing because that's what they live and breathe every day. So whether it's a mentor or a specific person in this industry, that is wholeheartedly like the best thing that you can do. Um, the, I would say the other thing is invest in people. So whether you're investing time or, you know, you're hiring or whatever, don't be hiring for the specific job. People do not stay in jobs for like 30 years anymore. So invest in, in the person, find out who the person is. Are they somebody who you would love to have on your team? Because most of what we do, like, well, I know most of what we do is like, we're not curing cancer. We're teaching dance. Right. So I, I can pretty much, you know, if they have a dance background and they're great with kids, like, and they're an amazing person. That's who I want on my team. Um, very little else matters. I don't care if they know any of the software that we do or how to do any of the stuff. We are going to teach them. And in most jobs, that's the case. So I try and find people who are just rock star individuals and um, hire them for the position and then find out who they are and really what they want out of life and help them get to that next level. Not even if it means they leave you, like I would rather help somebody and be invested in a person helping them like achieve their end goal or what they want to go to next um, versus being like, you, you have to work for me as long as you possibly can. Like that actually yields the best employer relationship. And they do end up working for you longer actually, because they just enjoy it so much. Um, and the relationship you have is one of trust and transparency and that just, it helps your business run so much smoother. So I would, I would say those are my, probably my top two things, but yeah. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I, as you were talking, I forgot that I had another question that I forgot to ask you before. <laughs> now I know you mentioned um, Sophia the first when you were talking. So did you have any issues with trademarks or any legalities in that sense? That's so, Disney yeah, related, we don't right? we don't dictate which stories you know they read or whatever. Um, we're not providing anything that has copyright as the as the franchisor. So they have full control over what stories they read. They don't have to do Sophia the First. We have costuming and it's very generic. So if you have a purple dress, you know, you could pair it with Sophia the First or you could pair it with something else. Um, but because we're not selling, you know, we're not selling the books, we're not selling the story, uh, you know, we're not mandating that they use certain stories. We usually don't bump, against, bump up against anything like that. Sort of similar to how like a library would be reading those stories as part of story time. Okay. Okay. That makes, that makes so much sense. Um, now I do want to ask about, cause you have the private label dancewear as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that's like another business on top yeah. of all of this that you had to learn as well. Yeah. So, we, we, <laughs> we found out very early on that dancewear companies are not very reliable in terms of inventory and sizing. Everything is super inconsistent. We can never get the same thing. And I was just like over it. Once we had a couple locations to manage, I was like, I can't do this anymore. We're talking about thousands of pairs of shoes every year. Like I can't keep going back to them and wondering if they're going to have a more effective order from somebody else. And it's a different size. It was a mess. 
So we decided to um, start developing our own private label. And so we have the, the apparel that our kids wear, right? So like we have the smallest, I think the smallest shoes on the market, actually. <laughs> I don't know okay. if you can buy tap shoes smaller than we make them, um, but we have tap shoes, ballet shoes, uh, leotards, tights, accessories, everything, you know, made for us. And it's all consistent sizing. So again, coming from like the customer's perspective, if you fit into a small child in one of our leotards, you fit into a small child in all of them. So it makes it easy to shop. The shoes are according to street shoe size, which sounds really common sense, but it's not, that's not how any other dance shoes fit. So, um, it was really at the end of the day, even though it's a huge time investment and you're right, it is an entirely separate business because now we have an online like e-commerce site, which anybody can order from. It's not just sold in our boutiques. Um, it was, it was an investment of time that was worth it because it's actually much easier <laughs> to just develop our own than it is to try and source it and make it convenient for parents. Um, but yeah, that's been, that's been a whole other animal that we actually started to develop during COVID when we had some, you know, like kind of downtime, we did our site that was direct to consumer. So anybody can order it now. And then we act as the wholesaler for all of our studios. So it takes that work off their back too, of having to source items for their boutiques. Okay. So do you have to carry the inventory locally or is it drop shipping? Um, so we actually have a warehouse where we, get the inventory and then we're shipping out depending on whether it's going to a customer and they're ordering like one piece or whether it's going to our studios and they're ordering, you know, 20 of them or something like that. Yeah. It's all housed one place. Oh my gosh. So that's, that's three different businesses that mm -hmm. you've developed in the past, what, five years. Yeah. <laughs> Am I doing the math right? Oh my gosh. That's insane. <laughs> that's so crazy when you think about it like that, but also so smart because it's, it, it just all makes so much sense. So I'm glad that you didn't move forward with that other business. <laughs> you moved forward with Me too. Business, so. <laughs> um, so I would love to hear if you have any stories that you can share just about the experience in general. Are there any like fun stories or are there any stories that were more learning experiences, I guess, that you can share? Oh, uh, about franchising, you mean, or just the just business in general, franchising, whatever you want to talk about. Hmm. So it's interesting because, you know, like I said, you don't know what you don't know. And being in business at every level of business, you're going to encounter different things that feel scary, right? So the things that happen when you are like, you know, CEO of, you know, Bank of America are very different than what I experienced as CEO of Bella Ballerina and, and very different than what I experienced when I was just owner of one location of Bella Ballerina. So every, like, every level of business has brought new surprises and new, absolutely terrifying experiences. And I think just having, you know, the, the hindsight to be like, I felt this way before there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, like for example, most business owners, I hope that if you are in business for yourself, you can go your entire business life without being sued. And it sounds like a really shameful thing if you're sued for anything, but I have been sued, you know, by a former employee for something that ended up being just completely nonsensical and thrown out. But at the time, I felt like a lot of shame around that, even though I knew I had done nothing wrong. And it was a huge waste of money. And I was absolutely terrified at the time. Um, now I look back on it with a whole different perspective. It doesn't make me mad. I was like, great. I learned something from that. I'm prepared for if anything happens in the future. Um, but I think it's one of those things that like nobody talks about because you, it, like I said, it feels very like negative, like, oh, you did something wrong. It's like, no, you didn't actually do anything wrong. So, I mean, it, I, I think I say that because I don't want people to think that there's, you know, some, some negative connotation with like, there's just different things that are going to happen to you in the course of business. And it's all new and it's all terrifying, no matter how experienced you are. Um, but it always helps to have somebody else who's walked the road before. So that way you can get through it a little bit easier without feeling so much fear or feeling so much anxiety over different pieces of growing your business. Even when we invested in like the, the retail side of our business, it was a huge, like, reinvestment. And I mean, I've started a business before I've invested huge in my own business, but to do it all over again was like a whole moment, you know? So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, there's been a lot of like ups and downs. I mean, definitely more ups than downs, but, um, but really kind of just create, it always feels like a crazy roller coaster and like, nobody will let you off. 
<laughs> I completely agree with that. And it's funny that you mentioned the suing thing. Well, not funny. And I'm sorry that happened, but the stigma around it, right? Because my husband, well, he used to be a nurse at the hospital and he would tell me all the time that the doctors are getting sued. Like, Constantly. Doctors are constantly getting sued. And that's yep. also something that I guess you don't, I've never heard that before. He told me that, but he's like, it's just something that comes with the territory. So it's, it it's the same thing. It does. Yeah. It absolutely does. And same thing. It's not that they necessarily did anything wrong. Who knows right. what the end result of that is. It's just, it's part of what comes with it. And I had somebody tell me that once, if you've been in business your whole life and never been sued, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> oh, but that's interesting. I was like, okay. And then it finally happened to me. And I was like, yep. I know what you're meaning like, now, I made it. but I made it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was sad too, because at the time it was like talking about franchising and all of the, you know, proprietary information that really you're getting as a franchisee. Um, what it was surrounding was uh, a copyright issue. A former employee had taken our, um, our curriculum and which actually there's nothing proprietary about because I can't trademark or copyright steps that have existed for years and everybody else uses. There's nothing proprietary about that. I'm not trying to protect anything. Um, we do them in a certain order for certain age groups, but she took the curriculum and backdated a copyright on it uh, and said that she developed it and that it belonged to her and that we were using it. It was, um, I mean, it is crazy the links that people will go to. And like I said, at the end of the day, it was like, they threw it out. It was like this doesn't even make any sense, but, um, but it's really, it, it's, it's just nuts. And it's not how much of a distraction some things can be away from your business. I mean, I've, like I said, I've been in business for over 10 years now. And I know over that time, there's been things like that, which are related to my business, but kind of this total sidebar thing that can sidetrack you. I've had those, like, you know, that serial entrepreneur, like maybe I should start something else. Maybe I should do something else. And I get so distracted by those thoughts they distract me from my day to day or personal things happen. And I just, I'm like, I need to take like a little bit of a break, a little bit of breather and sort of purposely distract myself. So um, the growth of your business can be a roller coaster in itself just because of all of these like outside forces. And I do sometimes suffer from comparison syndrome, not necessarily comparison to like one person or other company, but just, I feel like personally, I should be further along than I am. And then I need to step back and just be like, no, those distractions were necessary for whatever reason. And the fact that they kept you from getting to that next point earlier means absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah. You just weren't ready for it. But like, also let's take a step back and remember that you started three companies and what did we say? Five years. Yeah. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> right. You've done an amazing job. That's incredible. So Thank you, Natalie, for being here. Thank you for sharing your experience. Before we hop off, do you have any tips? I know you've shared some before, but like maybe your one big tip for somebody who's thinking about starting to franchise their business. Is there something somewhere that they should go first or something that they should consider? Yeah. So like I said, it's, it's basically starting an entire different business. So you have to make sure that you have all of your ducks in a row with your existing business, basically that you've worked yourself out of operations for your existing business because you it's really difficult to focus on building a franchise and running an existing business. So unless you're in that place, you probably aren't ready. Also, you know, to have your existing business have multiple locations in different markets already, because that is something that um, franchise boards are going to want to look for when they're approving your franchise documents. Um, they want to see that this isn't a fluke, you know, and so that they can confidently tell people in their state, yes, if you sign up to open a Bella Ballerina, like it's a proven model. So those thing, two things are really important to set yourself up for those first before you even really go down that road. Um, but it's always good to like, if you're thinking about franchising and even have it in the back of your mind, have, you know, have an idea of what you need to do. Like what are the ducks that you need to have in a row? There are companies out there who will literally take your whole business and create a franchise around it. So they help you set up the infrastructure. They help you say, well, what kind of training do you do? Let's get it on video. Let's get manuals together or whatever works for you. Um, and then, like I said, hiring professionals in the franchising field, because it is so, so, so valuable. And that's an area you can make 
big money mistakes. If you don't, um, don't be like me and have to write your franchise agreement twice. <laughs> That's oh, what yes. I did. <laughs> yes. So I spent that $25,000 twice. Um, but you know, it, it, it's because I didn't work with somebody who was franchise specific in the beginning. That's probably the biggest thing, but they can help you even if it's something that's years in the future for you, they can say, this is what you need to do before you actually get to that point and can give you some really solid guidance. Yeah, that's so true. So at, at least if nothing else, I would say get a franchise attorney, if nothing else, because 1, the contracts percent. are completely different. Well, yep. oh, one thing I forgot to ask you before too, how many locations do you have right now, franchise and corporate? Um, so right now we have 13 and we've got a whole bunch more in the pipeline. That's amazing. <laughs> we've, we're having some pretty explosive growth. So that's good. Good problem that's to great. have. But yeah, yeah. That's great. Well, congratulations on all of your growth. And if somebody wants to connect with you to just say hi or learn more about Bella, Be- Be- I can't say it, Bella Ballerina, where <laughs> should they go? So I'm always hanging out on Instagram on um, our handles at Bella Ballerina Studios. I'm on our stories there all the time. I love to connect with people in our in our DMs on Instagram, but um, you can always just email me too. Just Natalie at BellaBallerina.com. Perfect. We'll put all that in the show notes as well. So thank you again for being here, Natalie. Perfect. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was super fun.